All right. So topic number one is really starting to start with the, the basic um, premise of the book, the idea that STEM is all around us. This is part of who we are, how we make sense of the world, and the power of starting to see that we are awakening the spirit of young people. The early statement that you made in the book, um, many of us mistakenly believe that STEM only happens in labs and clean rooms, but it also happens in garages, basements, parks, cities, farms, and rural areas. Right. So I'd love to hear your inspiration and how you started to um, the conversation in the book and how that connects to your personal experience, whether it's your story as a student or story as an early um, math and science teacher? I mean, you know, the, the, the beginning point of, of any conversation has to, with STEM has to begin with the perceptions of STEM. Like we can't talk about how to teach STEM better or how to connect STEM to young people without first really like making some sense of this thing. Like, what is it? And, and what gets attached to it? Um, what gives it its meaning? What kind of power does it hold with certain people? Who gets engaged by it? Who gets empowered by it? Who gets disempowered by it? So I wanted to begin with just deconstructing it. STEM is a set of subjects that we bring together. And as we put these subjects together, they have this power that they hold and this perception and the imagination of the public. They're for the best and the brightest and the smartest. And, and it's about white lab coats and the kids who pass all the tests in classes and the ones who have the ability to take the robotics class after school and the extra tutoring. Like there are all these things get wrapped into STEM and STEM is none of those things right? It's a way of looking at the world. It's a set of skills you can develop. It's in the way that you play. It's in the questions that you ask. It's in the perpetual discovery of new information. It's in how you can have these tools to help you make sense of the world. And it is a part of how we breathe and live. It's, it's in how we read our books now that tech. It's in how we walk down the streets. It's in making sense of global warming. It's in making sense of data around the pandemic. It's in people who have vaccine hesitancy. It's in, it's in our everyday discourse. Mm -hmm. And the more that we take this thing that should be a part of all of our existence and make it only for a segment of the population, the, the less likely it is for all of us collectively to benefit from STEM knowledge. Yeah. And so I wanted to begin with just decolonizing STEM and democratizing STEM, that we all have the ability to be able to be successful in these disciplines. Our experiences in schools with teachers who broke our hearts in third grade do not determine our ability to be able to connect to STEM. If you've had a post-traumatic STEM disorder through bad teaching at some point in your life, you can recover and heal. Um, it's really about democratizing these disciplines and that's the beginning. Yeah. And then after that, um, we can get into the other dimensions, you know, um, making it messy. It happens everywhere. You know, STEM is not clean and sanitized. It's the messier you get, the better you are at STEM. Um, the more complicated the questions, the better you are at STEM. It's never been a set of disciplines that are about finding the right answer. It's always about posing the right questions. Yes. And all of us can pose questions because that's a part of human existence. So one of the interesting um, quotes that you had in that piece in the early section is, your core cells shouldn't be sacrificed um, for their, their stem cells and vice stem cells and vice versa. So yeah. starting to have students, young people recognize themselves in STEM because of their natural problem solving tendencies, their questioning and curiosity about the world and how to start to begin to feel like they are empowered to make sense of things and have folks take them seriously on their raising those questions, statements, solutions, and innovations. Absolutely. I, you know, the, the beauty of, of youth and adolescence mm. is that you don't have all the answers yet. And so you're perpetually on a search of what the answers are to the billions of questions that you're asking. You come out in the world and you say, oh my gosh, I cry. If I cry for loud enough, will they respond? Oh my gosh, they responded. They gave me food. Hmm. So like that child is going through a scientific process. Pose a question, conduct the research, conduct research. What have what my parents done over time? Here's the solution. So the, 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 like our natural instinct is to engage in practices that actually align to what the folks who are engaging in STEM are doing 
on a university and research level. And so you, the kind of creativity, imagination, question asking, inductive and deductive reasoning that the most brilliant people in the world are doing that we revere are the exact same thing that two-year-olds are doing every day. Yeah. And so we have to remind the two-year-olds and the adults in their lives that they actually have a natural inclination towards STEM from early. And then you have to convince them that the thing that they do mm -hmm. is actually STEM, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you asked me a million questions about that thing. I mean, you kept doing things to find out if that was the right answer. Did you know that you were forming hypotheses and that you were posing deep questions? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you're a scientist. And so they start growing up thinking of themselves as scientists, right? Oh my gosh, you calculated how many times that happened? They start, you're a mathematician. So it's, it's about constructing the identity from early yeah. so that when they engage in schools, that oftentimes cuts them off from their natural inclinations, the things that have been developed from when they're early on in their lives can kick in, right? So if, if I believe it about myself and I have a schooling experience that challenges the questions that I have enough of a groundswell of belief in my ability in these disciplines to help me to be able to overcome the academic challenges. And this is not to say that STEM is not rigorous, right? It's not to say that it just all comes, it comes to you right away. It's part of the pro, like the, rig the rigor is not negative, right? It's, oh my gosh, I have another opportunity to express some creativity. So it's a lot of reframing of the language, yep. um, a reimagining of the discourse um, and a forging of an identity from early that can help a young person to overcome the challenges over the course of their lives. So the interesting um, uh, example that you shared early on is the Central Park story yeah. of how, how you brought your students to uh, Central Park and what happened as a result. So can you just quickly um, tell folks that story? Um, yeah, I'll share a piece of it that, that, that I think would be helpful for teachers and for parents. You know, it, it's, you know, I brought these young people into a park at, at Central Park and it's a beautiful, lovely park. Everyone knows Central Park and, you know, you, you have the Wallerman Rank and you have all the, you know, the beautiful architecture. It's just like a, a beautiful and gorgeous space. And these were young folks who I was teaching in a school in the Bronx, New York. And then I brought them to a local park uh, that was near their school. And the first question they asked was, well, Dr. E, why does our park not look like that park? Um, there, there are things we saw there we don't see here. Our park looks a little bit more dirty. And so, and so it, it was literally about bringing them to different contexts and environments and having them draw conclusions about what was going on. And then I had them write a letter you know, to a, to a, to a government official about the fact that they don't understand why their park looks the way it does. And it was a great sort of heartfelt, like our park should be clean. We should have the same thing that Central Park does. And then we said, well, like, if you really want to convince them to do something about this park, you've got to be able to add some data, some research, some scientific information to your letter. So they wrote their initial letter that was beautifully heartfelt. Mm -hmm. Then they conducted research to make their letter, you know, the, the, you know there, there are you know, chlorofluorocarbons in the air here and there's an erosion that's going on in this park. And it's like, and so all of a sudden they're supplementing the natural inclination to address something in their community with some scientific and mathematical data. Yeah. And unbeknownst to them, they were doing something that, that, that felt good, you know, that, 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 that really meant something, but they realized that if I understand the language of science and math, I can make my point better. Yeah. I think teaching should happen in that way. Any good teaching begins with striking the imagination in the heart of young people to make them feel compelled to want to engage in the enterprise. And what you'll find is if a, if a young person is engaged and motivated and they feel offended by this thing, like, oh my gosh, this is, they, they feel like it's unjust, you know? Yeah. You, you, you kind of like, you, you raise, the, you raise the, 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 the stakes a little bit. Oh, you're, you're really frustrated, aren't you? You're really angry, aren't you? You want them to feel. I don't care what the emotion is. It might be love, it might be hate but I want the young folks to feel. Now, once they feel, I know then that I can dangle the content right out of their reach. And it will chase that content with fervor because the emotion has been charged to begin with. And so um, that's part of the, the sort of uh, pedagogical strategies that yeah. I try to like lay the breadcrumbs for yeah. in the book. And that's really awakening the spirit of our young people, because when it comes to clarifying the value of the content, it's grounded in the problems and the challenges and the ideas that are all around us. So absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. You, 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 when you ignite the spirit, you, it, yeah. you expand the mind. Um, and, and that's the way it's always worked. When you teach only to the mind, the mind is finite. 
they can only soak in so much information that you give just to their brain. But if you ignite the soul, the soul, the spirit of the young person, it expands the capacity of the mind uh, to make sense of content.